You know, they talk to us as Protestants as if everything is just all good. Uh, as if these anathemas don't even exist, when the fact of the matter is they do exist. Men venerated other men. And these other men who were being venerated are not God. So case closed. And I would say as a Protestant, that's, that's not very convincing. Because I think if they would have started with the whole debate would have been done. All right, hey guys, this is Jacob with the Protestant Podcast, and I'm joined today with Pastor Paul Liberati. Uh, we're going to have a brief discussion on the Seventh Ecumenical Council. That was in 787 on icons. That's particularly the focus. We just want to talk about the biblical support as well as the substance and weight to this discussion. Why Protestants should care about the Seventh Ecumenical Council and uh, how the church has always viewed icons and veneration. So. I'll pass it off to you, Pastor Paul. Tell us about why this discussion is important, why Protestants should care, Protestants and Catholics alike should care about this discussion. I think if we were gonna ask the question, why is it important, it's because the council made it a matter of salvation. And, and we're not just talking about the anathemas, but yes, the anathemas is where it really comes to a head. You know, even in the definition of the council, it's, it's telling us <clears throat> not what we may do, but what we must do in terms of exposing these representations of art in the churches, on vestments, on panels, in your homes, you know, all of that. Uh, but then, yeah, they, they attach uh, anathemas to anyone who would disagree with that. So it gets really, really serious. And it's not something, frankly, it's not something we would spend our time on if it wasn't that serious. But I have friends who are Roman Catholic. I have friends who are Eastern Orthodox. And, uh, you know, they talk to us as Protestants as if everything is just all good, uh, as if these anathemas don't even exist, when the fact of the matter is they do exist. And in the Eastern Orthodox Church, there's an annual celebration, sort of like a ritual anathematizing of all Protestants. Those who deny the seven holy ecumenical council, those who do not worship our Lord Jesus Christ in the icon depicted after his human nature, anathema. Anathema, anathema, anathema. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Willis Bigley, Henry VIII, the ungodly king, and those assembled together with them and all the Protestant groups, anathema. Anathema, anathema, anathema. John Calvin, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, uh, and everyone who would follow any one of those traditions. So. You know, it is, it is very, very serious because what they're saying to us is if you don't agree with the rulings of this council, then you are anathema. Let me just read one of those anathemas to us. The first one is a little bit, uh, it's, it's bottom tier, okay? We don't have a problem with it. It says, if anyone does not accept representation in art of evangelical scenes, let him be anathema. So any sort of gospel scenes can be depicted in art, fine. But then the next one says, if anyone does not salute such representations as standing for the Lord and his saints, let him be anathema. So you can see from that, uh, we're not just to uh, tolerate their presence, tolerate their existence, but we are to respond to these images by way of salutation, greeting, um, and obviously what they call veneration. Yeah, so pretty, pretty important. Yeah, and so when we look at the historic significance of this too, uh, the iconoclasts and the icono duels, the supporters and the antagonists here, uh, I mean, there's a lot of savagery. There was death involved. I mean, uh, Constantine of Constantinople was publicly beheaded. We had monks that were lashed to death. I mean, there was uh, a grueling and savage process that this went through. Uh, to stamp itself into history. So it definitely matters. The saints of history definitely cared about this. But of course, we want to know what the Word of God has to say about it, whether or not this has biblical sanction. Yeah, exactly. We're Protestants. And as Protestants, we are probably not on the side of the iconoclasts, um, probably more in line with the Carolingians, if you look at the historical record. But again, that would be a historical treatment. I think you're right. Where, where we need to go in this discussion, because we are Protestants, uh, is to the one fundamental and most important question, and that is, uh, does this council, do the rulings of this council uh, agree with Holy Scripture? Because the Scripture is the highest and the most... Um, we would say it's the highest and the only infallible source of truth, 
right? So, so that means it's like the norm. This is what people will say. It's the norm that norms all other norms. Not to say that councils and the church itself doesn't have authority. We, we acknowledge that. But, but the authority of the church is under the authority of Holy Scripture. So our question today, I think, should be, if we're going to start this discussion, is uh, what do the Scriptures say? So when the council got together and they started to debate these things out, if you go back in church history, you realize how much Scripture was put on the table in these debates. Um, just think about Nicaea and think about Chalcedon, how, you know, biblical argument after biblical argument, exegesis and passage after passage. The question is, in this seventh ecumenical council, um, how much scripture was put forward? What were the biblical arguments and are they valid, right? So I think that's where we need to go. Yeah, and so... As we start the discussion, uh, especially as we start to get into the biblical evidence that supports or the lack thereof of this position, uh, Exodus 20, 4 through 6, that's the second commandment. This is what really gives us kind of a starting point, a launching pad when it comes to icons and veneration, how we're to relate with them. So let me just make a, a quick reference here from Exodus 20. I'll read this one here for you. Uh, the word says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, am your God. I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love and keep my commandments. So that's that's going to be a good primer for us. We're going to start with the second commandment and then work from there to see what the rest of the scriptural import has to say. Yeah, you know, I wish the council would have started with that commandment too. Uh, I, because I think if they would have started with that commandment, the the whole debate would have been done, mm -hmm. actually. And and it's almost like um, it's like that would be the climax of uh, our investigation. If If you don't mind, let me just freeze frame that passage and just set it to the side for just a second, only because I want to show where the council went in terms of their thinking along biblical lines, and then we'll return to the passage you just quoted, and that, again, I think ends the whole debate, because that's where they should have gone. Okay. Um, what they did, what they did is they did something different. Now, of course, as you read through um, the canons, the Acts, you know, you read through all those things, uh, you see that they sprinkle biblical references throughout throughout the, the, the proceedings there. Um, but their main biblical argument, I think the most important one, is basically to marshal together different examples where we find men in the Old Testament, the people of God, venerating that which is not God. So that's key, um, because they're grabbing onto this term venerating, and they're saying worship belongs to the divine nature only. We only worship the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? But they say, but to venerate is a lesser form of devotion. To venerate is something that we see people doing in the Old Testament, and I think there's a few instances in the New, um, towards objects, whether people or things, that are not God, okay? Now, that's the essence of their, their argument, and, and they bring forward a couple of... Uh, a couple of different examples. Let, let me let me share a couple examples that I think um, make their point. Uh, first of all, they point out that in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 41, David had reverence toward Jonathan. And the key there is a particular Greek term, proskuneo. Uh, he he uh, venerated Jonathan, didn't worship him. That would be latruo or latria, as they used to say. Um, but this is proskuneo. It's a particular Greek term that they're saying refers to a veneration that is less than worship, and it's acceptable, okay? Uh, another passage is um, Genesis 33, 3, where you have Jacob bowing down before Esau, and again, it's proskuneo. And then you have uh, Genesis 23, 3, where Abraham is bowing down before the Hittites as a sign of respect and reverence. And again, it's proskuneo. So, so they've marshaled together several uh, of these biblical examples, and they say, hey, look, there's a form of devotion, of reverence, that we're calling veneration, okay? It's proskuneo. 
And that is what we believe should be done unto objects and persons that are not God. And therefore, they're making a line to say, if we could do it to men, we could do it to the images of those men. You see? Yeah. So that's, that's in essence their, their argument. Yeah, that's fascinating. So they'll, they'll yeah. draw a, a correlation between the biblical examples we have. And so they say, if we've seen it here, then we can do it with the images and other icons. But I think it's also fascinating, Pastor Paul, how the councils so often like to appeal to the historicity of their position and how this is the apostolic deposit. This is the tradition that's gone back uh, all the way to the first century with the apostles. So here at the Second Council in Nicaea, let me just give you a quick quote. It says, well, this is what they claim. This is the faith of the apostles. This is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the Orthodox. This is the faith that has sustained the world, believing in one God to be praised in Trinity. We kiss the honorable images. May those who do not hold accordingly be anathema. May those who do not believe accordingly be driven far away from the church. So they're saying a lot more than <clears throat> the fact that this is what Scripture seems to teach. They're saying this is what the church has always done, right? right. And I know that's that's a pretty right. problematic position to take because um, that's not necessarily what we see, certainly not in Scripture and certainly not throughout history. Yeah, yeah, we could do like an early church father survey or something like that and, and see... Um, that really icon veneration, image veneration doesn't really appear for several hundreds of years. I think uh, Gavin Ortland does some really, really good work on that. Yeah. We can cover that material, but here's where the two come together, right? Because, because the question when we talk about the early church and the apostolic practice actually begins in Scripture. Of course. So, so the question is, what did the apostles who were the early church, you know, how, you know, what did they do? What did they believe about this? And, and, but. But let's tie that together, just launching from uh, the argument that they're giving here. So they're marshalling all these examples together, and they're saying, look, men venerated other men, and these other men who were being venerated are not God. So case closed. And I would say as a Protestant, that's, that's not very convincing. It's, it's not very convincing for, I would say, two reasons. Um, the first one is that these passages, all the examples that they've given— are what we would call descriptive passages, but they're not prescriptive passages. And that might sound like a fine distinction, but it's actually very, very important, right? So the reason it's so important is that uh, examples that we find in Scripture uh, are not always given to us uh, to present a normative practice, okay? So just because you see an example doesn't mean that that now becomes the normative practice for the church. So descriptions of what men have done and prescriptions of what the Word of God teaches us to do are two different things in many cases. And I would argue that they're two different things in this particular case, right? And and uh, if, that, if that's going above the head of some of our viewers, maybe we can give an illustration to show why that's so important. Um, Think about polygamy. Think about marriage in the Bible, right? So, so someone could easily come to us and say, "Well, I've got all these all these examples of Old Testament saints who had more than one wife." You know, polygamy, many wives. Look at Solomon. <laughs> you know, um, and therefore we can draw a straight line from those biblical examples of what these men did, and what we ought to do today, or what's permissible, or what's required of us today. And and again. There's a difference between descriptive passages of Scripture and prescriptive passages of Scripture. And, and the way you know that these biblical examples are not something to follow is that when you get to the New Testament, further revelation is given on this particular subject, right? So Jesus comes along and he makes it abundantly clear that in the beginning, God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. So he... He uh, clarifies that. That is further revelation clarifying, shedding light upon an Old Testament practice. Now, just because that Old Testament practice wasn't condemned by God when it was being done doesn't mean it was approved by God. Right. Because later on, you see Jesus actually telling us what God's design was. And then uh, later on, the Apostle Paul, he picks that up and he says, uh, because this is the biblical way, this is the creational way, uh, therefore, if any man wants to be an officer in the church of Jesus Christ, 
uh, he must be a man with only one wife. So, so it, it becomes clearer and clearer as more and more revelation is given. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, of course. So, and this is the mistake that the council is making, right? Yes. Is, is drawing too close of a parallel between the descriptive and the prescriptive right. uh, without making right. that distinction. Right. Right. And, and okay, so let's, let's back up and let's see how this applies to their argument. So you have these biblical examples of what men are doing. The question is, should those men be doing that? I think one argument could be made that this is a civil expression when you honor and revere and respect another person because of that person's position or his office or his relationship to you. I mean, honor your father and your mother. That honor can't be uh, worship. There has to be a distinction there, right? But the council is making an argument from the term proskuneo, okay? that They're grabbing onto a Greek term. They're getting technical. They're getting exegetical. So let's search that out because when you, when you do um, continue to read in Scripture, you find that further revelation clarifies the limitations on proskuneo, Okay, so let me give you an example. By the time you get to the New Testament, what we have are at least three instances uh, where proskuneo is denied and forbidden to be performed toward that which is not God. The first one is in Acts chapter 10, verses 25 and 26. And uh, this is when Peter is going to Cornelius' house. And it says, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and venerated him, proscuneo. But Peter lifted him up, saying, stand up, for I too am a man. Hmm, that's interesting. That doesn't go with the assumption that is set forth by the council. Also, in the book of Revelation, there's two instances where John wants to venerate the angel who's revealing things to him, and the angel will not allow it. Uh, let me read those. Revelation 19.10. Then I fell down at his feet to venerate, proskuneo, to venerate him. Uh, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Venerate God. You see. And then Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to venerate at the feet of the angel which showed these things to me. That's proskuneo. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. And then he gives him a command and he says, venerate God. See where this is going because... Um, just from these three passages in the New Testament, this is further, this is didactic revelation, right? This is prescriptive. Uh, don't do this, do that. You know, don't venerate uh, the apostles. Peter would not allow himself to be venerated in his person, but only venerate God. The angel would not allow John to venerate him in his person, but only venerate God. And all of these terms are proskuneo. So, so my argument as a Protestant would be that, yes, we do have those biblical examples, but they're not authoritative. They, they don't create a one-to-one -one, uh, parallel with, um, I think, the outcome that the council is seeking to arrive at, especially because all we have to do is say, if Peter didn't want people venerating him in his person, what makes you think that Peter would want them to go and venerate an image of him, right? So... So yeah, Pastor Paul, it's clear that the apostles don't want themselves to be venerated, but what about the arguments which advocate for images of God to be venerated? So what if, uh, what if we have an image of Jesus or the Holy Spirit? What about venerating God, themself, God himself through the images? So I think, I think the position of the council is that images of any, any person, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he has a human nature, um, an image can be made of him, and an image can be venerated. But also, they, they do include images of the saints and of Mary, the mother of our Lord. So, so I don't think that they're, they're compartmentalizing those, and that's, that's another issue that needs, it's sort of tangled up, and it needs to be untied. It's like a knot where, where we're saying we're not even making any difference between images of the Lord Jesus Christ and images 
of the saints. So, so they're really treating them in the same way, saying that they can, they can all be made and they can all be venerated according to the veneration due. You know, I'd go back and I would say this. I, I would say the first reason the arguments put forward are not convincing is because further didactic revelation clarifies things and demonstrates that uh, this is an inappropriate action, okay? But the second reason is that none of the passages that are put forward, right, uh, all of those biblical examples of men venerating men, all of those... Um, are given as examples, but in none of them do we even have the mention of an image. Like the whole point that we're debating over is whether or not images like pictures, paintings, murals, um, and obviously in the West, statues, right? In the East, icons, right? The question is whether those objects could be venerated, and there is no biblical example of anyone venerating images of Jesus, the saints, or anything else. Yeah, I mean, what we, we do have examples from, from Exodus and other portions of the Bible where images of God are erect, such as um, the Israelites who crafted a golden calf, thinking themselves that this was Yahweh. But here we have another example of a condemnation where this is considered idolatry. Yeah. So even where we have supposed veneration or worship of God in the form of an icon or a statue, it's always condemned. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And I think this is where we turn the corner. We make that sharp turn and we go back to Exodus 20, which you led with. Because, because, because the council is seeking to make a biblical argument and they're seeking to make a grammatical argument from the term proskuneo. They marshal together several examples, but none of those examples have anything to say about images. But there is one passage that does have something to say about images, and the Greek term proskuneo is used in connection uh, with those images. And that's Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. So you, you already read it, but, but the section where it says, you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them, that's the term proskuneo. And and, and here, what, when, when it talks about images, it's not just talking about images of God or images of false gods. It's literally talking about any visible representation whatsoever. Things in heaven, things on the earth, things under the earth, right? So, so when it comes to images and visible representation, we are to venerate none of them, not a single one, no matter what it's representing. You don't bow down to it. You don't kiss it. You don't burn incense to it. You don't light candles to it. You don't pray through it. Like, you just don't do it. And, and not only because God says, I will not give my glory to graven images, but here he says, I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God says, if you do this, you hate me and I will punish you. I mean, that, so, 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 you know, just to set the, the contrast here, you have, you have a council of men who are telling us that we are eternally condemned if we don't venerate images, the holy icons, right, on one side. And then on the other side, you have God Almighty. You have the Lord himself telling us that if you do venerate images, that you hate him and that you are now his enemy. So, so you've got men, the word of men, and you've got God, the word of God. Well, I'll tell you where I lean, man. <laughs> yep. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. That's so right. we'll, we'll trust the scriptures on this one. Absolutely. And that's, and, that, and that's why a discussion like this is important, not just for Catholics and Eastern Orthodox uh, friends, but, but for our Protestant friends. Uh, because because we ha we're in that position where the other two traditions are basically saying, ah, oh, you guys don't have the fullness of the faith. And we're like, the fullness of the faith? Like, what does that fullness consist of? And they say, well, and they start naming off all of their distinctives. And one of those distinctives is something like this. And we have to say, I don't think so. I will not bow down to any graven image. I don't care what kind of visible representation it is. I don't care what it represents. I'm not bowing down to it because uh, your anathema does not compare 
to the condemnation that comes from God himself. Yeah, and Pastor Paul, I know this is definitely a more nuanced discussion as well. There's, uh, as you mentioned, Gavin Ortland, uh, his discussions with Jimmy Aiken and Joe Heschmeyer, those are really great. So for people that want more of a historical basis and some of the development, he calls it uh, an accretion, uh, definitely check out Gavin Ortland. But just for kind of a cursory level biblical presentation, uh, this is just a bit of a primer, but it definitely helps kind of get the ball rolling and start thinking about this biblically because it's easy to get caught up in traditions and just start quoting the the, the creeds or quoting the uh, citations from the actual councils. But we yeah. need to go back to the scriptures, sola scripture, Absolutely. of course. Uh, and for those who want a more comprehensive discussion, check out some of those other videos. But uh, for now, any parting words before we... Uh, Cut, cut the stream. Yeah, yeah. I, I do want to say that uh, you can tell that I'm passionate about this subject. Uh, I used to be Roman Catholic, so I have a background and a history, and I still have Roman Catholic family, dear friends, Orthodox friends as well. Uh, so I am passionate about this. But, but, but Jacob, I think you can, uh, you can verify. We're not, we're not mad at anyone. Uh, it is a little frustrating in ecumenical dialogues when this seems to be like this huge stumbling block and that Protestants receive this second-class citizenship. So so we want to have vigorous debate. We want to have, um, you know, sincere, transparent uh, presentations of saying, this is where we stand and this is how we feel about it. And we are willing to suffer um, because we're trying to be faithful to the Word of God. So, so don't mistake, I guess what I want to say is don't mistake our passion uh, for, you know, uh, antagonism, because we're not against Roman Catholics per se, or Eastern Orthodox Christians at all. We, we're actually for them. And we think that uh, part, of, part of the way that we're going to be able to become more unified is if we have these hearty debates. All right, Pastor Paul, well, thank you so much for your time. Um, obviously, this is a discussion that warrants more nuance, but I think it's just kind of a surface level scriptural introduction. This gives us something to work with. I'm sure there'll be more discussions on this in the future, but for now, uh, we'll see you later. Thank you.